So I know if everyone here has had compound interest at some point or another, and we'll have to talk about the number e because that's the, the base of our power when we're talking about uh, compound interest that is continuously compounded. But in essence, compound in interest looks like this, and they may go through some simple interest first. Um, you're going to have your amount that you're, you, your final amount, so I guess you can say pf, and your principal amount, p sub zero, so that's starting time zero, times the power is going to be one plus the interest rate as a decimal divided by the number of compounding periods in t raised to the exponent of n times t, where again n is number of compounding periods periods in every t, t equals time in units. When I say units, it could be years, it could be months, it could be days. Typically for money and interest, it's years, okay? Typically, but not always. And R is your interest rate. And P sub zero, is your initial amount, your investment, your principal, and P sub F is your final amount. So how, the total amount of money you have when you're done with that time period. And sometimes you see the equation written this way, A, A equals A sub zero, one plus R over N raised to the NT. Sometimes you see A equals P, one plus r over n and t principal final amount so all the letters mean the same things in the same positions they just might use different letters or different notation okay and so uh this first part 5.7 there's a discussion here about in, uh, the idea of interest and i'll mimic that but i'll use different numbers so you'll have two examples you have this one in front of you and the one i'm going to write down so let's say you start out with a hundred dollars so let's say you start out with $100. So your principal equals $100. And your interest rate is 10%. Okay? And they used 1%, but I'd rather use 10% because that's more realistic with some investments. If you're talking about savings, it's not even 1%. Um, let's say the number of compounding periods in 1t is equal to 1 in t. And let's say that t is a year. Okay? Number of years. Okay. So that means that if there's only one compounding period in the number of years, that means n is equal to one year or one compounding period in the year. So we end up writing the equation. My final amount is equal to the principal, oops, times one plus r over n to the nt. But if I stick those numbers in for this little example, you start out with $100, one plus 0.1, so that's 10% written as a decimal over one, which is n, one times t. So a equals 100, one plus 0.1 to the t. So notice that in year in or at t equals one, so one year has gone by. Well, let's go, let's step back a second. At, at t equals zero, that means no time has gone by, you just stuck the money in the bank you get 100 times one plus 0.1 to the zero. But this whole thing raised to the zero is equal to one, correct? So that means A equals 100 times one, which is 100. So that means at time zero, you have $100. But that should make sense. You just stuck it in the bank, no interest has accrued. So I'm showing you that the formula actually works no matter what time period it is. Now let's go back to the base formula and figure out what's happening in some other areas. 1 plus 0.1 to the t. Let's say the t at t equals 1, so that one year has gone by. Okay, so 1 plus 0.1, and that t is equal to 1, right? So this is equal to 1. But if it's, if it's this to the 1, it's just that, right? So I can think of it this way. So really, let's distribute this 100 instead of adding those two numbers. I get $100, that's my original amount of money. This is this multiplied times that 100. So that 100 is my, my initial amount of money. 
plus 0.1 times 100, my initial amount of money, plus $10. So this is why many people think of this growth factor or this growth rate is going to end up being I'm, I'm keeping my whole amount and I'm adding 10% more. And so I get $110, right? Now, at t equals 2, 1 plus 0.1 t equals 2, that's 100, 1.1 squared. 1.1 squared is 1.21. So in other words, you're going to keep the whole amount you're going to keep the whole amount and then you're going to add 21%. So you get $121. But how can that be? Didn't I just add $10 and $10? No. So let's go back and look at it a different way. If I started out with my first when t equals 1, I had $110 when I was done. At t equals 2, remember, we can think of it as the previous amount times 1 plus 0.1. 100 and, I'm sorry, yeah, 110, the previous amount, times 1 plus, 1 plus 0.1. So this is 110 if I distribute, plus 10% of 110, which is not going to be 10. In fact, it's going to be $11. What's 10% times 110? 11. That's how I get the 121. So I'm taking this 10%, I'm taking this 10% and multiplying it times a larger value each time that t ticks over. For each year that's going by, I'm taking this 0.1 and multiplying it times a larger number. So for instance, it's a sub 3, which is when t is equal to 3. I have 100 times 1 plus 0.1 to the 3. But that's like taking the previous number and multiplying it times 1 plus 0.1, which is $121, I just keep it, plus 10% of that. So instead of $10 or $11, it's actually $12.10. So at t equals 3, I'm going to have, what is that, 133.1, $133.10. That's more than just adding 10 each year. Adding 10 each year would be a linear equation where I'm multiplying it, the slope, 10 times three years gone by, so I'm adding $30. This is not that. And so this is why compound interest, if you can put money aside and gain interest on it and never touch it, you will have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars by the time you're my age. If you just put $100 in every week or something like that, and gain it that's that's you're going to get the hundred dollars times 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 you know over and over and over again but you'll also gain interest on that which will be compounded on itself all right so that's that's what is happening here now this particular equation is simple interest when we don't have compounding periods but i'm going to tell you that's if or or you could say that we have one compounding period in a year so that's what i've shown you here if n equals one that's what this blocks is talking about. Now, we're going to compare different interests in this first problem. I'm going to try to do it quickly because the last video was super long. Let's try to get through this thing. Example one. Suppose you have $10,000. So my principal is $10,000. Okay? That you could put in either a checking account that earns no interest or a mutual fund that earns 5% interest. So 5% is 0 0.05 as a decimal. Or a risky stock option, you can hope to get 15% a year. So that's interest rate one. Interest rate two is 0.15, 15% per year. Model, a, model the potential growth of each investment. Compare the investments after 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So my first equation, my savings account, right, that gets no interest. I'm sorry, a checking account that gets no interest. Checking that's no interest. Well, my interest rate is equal to zero, right? So let's look at the formula. A equals 10,000. One plus zero over N, which is one, to the one times T. They're not going to say it that way because they've only introduced you to simple interest. I'm telling you, it's all the same equation. Don't memorize more. Just know that if 
if I'm talking about simple interest or it's not compounded, then n is equal to 1. So I get a equals 10,000 times 1 to the t. Well, 1 to the t is just 1. So my investment's always going to be $10,000, no matter what year it is, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it doesn't matter. So that checking is done. So let's look at the mutual fund that is 5% for interest, interest per year. So that's principal 1 plus 0 0.05 over 1 to the 1 times t. That's just me doing the compound interest formula. And now we'll adjust it. This is what they're expecting, simple interest at this point. So this p is 10,000, 1.05 to the t. Okay. Let's compare that to this, A equals 10,000, 1 plus 0.15 over 1 to the 1 times T, which means we just have this, 10,000 times 1.15 to the T. Now, let's look at when T is equal to 10, 20, 30, and 40 years, and Sorry, my A amount for that and my A amount for this. I'm probably going to get jammed up in here, but um, in that one column there. So let's go look at this. So let's pull up the Kugelator and let's do 10,000. Let's do it this way instead. Let's put it into Y equals. You don't have to do it this way. You can substitute 10, 20, 30, and 40 and just do, do it by hand. But uh, I think I want to be a little bit brighter about this. 1.05 raised to the x. And then I want to delete. Now uh, let's go over here and delete that. OK, so that should be all right. So now I have this exponential function. It's $10,000 times 1.05 to the x. So if I go to the table, hopefully I can see 10. 10 years, my $10,000 turns into 16,289. After 20 years, it turns into 26,533. And 30 years, it's 43,219. And 40 years, it's 7,400. Okay, $70,000 after 40 years. So, yeah, you wouldn't start out with 10K, you'd put $100 in a pop, and if you continued doing that, you'd have way more than $70,400. Uh, but in any case, what do we got here? Let's go back to the y equals, and we'll stick the other equation in here. Oops, let's hit enter. And we're going to put 10,000 times 1.15 to the x. We'll hit enter. We'll go to the table, and we'll look at our numbers. Look at 40. Instead of having $70,000, I have... 2.68 times 10 to the 6th. By the way, remember, 10 to the 6th is million, so I have $2.68 million. So $2.7 million. Okay? And if we look at year 40, I have $662,000. Uh, $618. $662,118. If I go look at year 20, Clearly, I'm going to have a number that's closer to what we have over there, but it's still going to be much more. 163,000, 665, and even only after 10 years, it's 40,456. So 10 years, that's the power of that 15%. This extra 10%, it, it makes this, after 10 years, more than half of what we get in 40 years. So magic of interest in compounding and exponential functions, okay? So that's all that stuff, all right? And here's the table, 2.68. Compounding at different intervals. So this is the compounding and 
I've already talked about it. Um, they're going to have this discussion in here, 1.03, 2, that's simple interest. Oh, this is compounded twice a year. And this is a way to calculate it if you wanted to figure it out. Turns out to be that. But who wants to do that multiple times? Sit there and do that. That's after two years. I'm going to take that. And I'm going to multiply it times that um, twice a year. That's at 6% twice a year. So um, because 3% is applied on this first amount halfway through, and then this 3% is applied to that total amount on the second half of the year. So you don't get 6% of 100 after the full year. You get 6.09%. Okay, so because of that compounding, you're not getting 6% after a year, you're getting 6.09%. We earn nine cents more if it's uh, uh, compounded twice in a single year, in a single T, okay? Then we call this the nominal interest and we call this the effective interest, okay? Uh, in real life, we call, this is mathematics, in real life, we call this the interest rate and the APR, annual percentage yield. What you actually yield is this, okay? So let's look at this. Compounding four times a year. Suppose that interest is compounded quarterly for, or four times a year. This is the effective interest rate. What is the investment on $100 worth at the end of a year? So you can do it the way they did it here. You can do this, uh, this is example two, and you can do the following. You take $100, you multiply it times one point What is the effective interest rate? What? Suppose an interest is compounded quarterly for, or four times per year. What is the effective interest rate? What is an investment? What the hell are you talking about? They don't give us a, ah. So we're supposed to assume 6%. So 1.0, now what do we figure out what that number is? Well, it's gonna be that 6% split up into four equal parts. So three halves. So this is, 1.0, uh, this is 0 0.06, 0 0.015, okay? And then I'm gonna do this how many times? Four times, right? Just like they did it twice. Or you can think of it as I'm taking 100 times 1.015 to the fourth. And that's going to be cuvillatory. What did I do that for? I meant to do that. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, 1.015 to the fourth. So I'm getting one point. Zero, zero, 00614. So instead of an extra 0.9% each year, I'm going to get an extra 0.14% per year, which ends up being another 14 cents, right? This ends up being $106.14. So if I compound, same interest rate, 6%, if I compound it twice a year, I get nine cents extra than I would if I compounded it once in that year. And if I just double the amount of compounding from twice to four, I get an extra 14 cents or five cents more. Maybe not a big deal when we're talking about 100, but we're talking about 10,000 or $100,000. That's a reasonable amount of money that you're not even doing anything to get. It's just sitting there. It is just sitting there. You're going about your business for the whole year. As long as we just compounded more frequently, we make more money on the same interest rate. Okay, so that's what they got. Compounding n times a year. So our formula, the one I shared with you early compared to when they wanted to share it with you, uh, I share it because they assume you've never seen it before. I know that you have, whether you recall it or not. And I'm sure we are, I'm pretty confident we are very, very reasonable mathematicians that we can sort through this stuff, right? So this is the number of compounding periods. So notice how I take the rate and divide it by four and then raise it an extra number of times, which is what we did. 1.015 was the result of taking 0 0.06, dividing it by four to get 0 0.015. And then that goes in there. So that's R divided by N. 
Then we took that n up here, which was applying this four different times for a given year long period. So that's, the, we were doing this math, just didn't, they just didn't tell you about it. I did, and now I just explained it. So they're gonna talk about the 6% here. Here is compounding. If I compound it twice a year, I'm gonna make an extra nine cents. If I compound it four times a year, 14 cents. If I compound it six times a year, 15 cents. 12 times a year, 17%, excuse me, 24 times a year, an extra 18 cents. Typically, we don't do that. Typically, at least here in the States, we do this 12 times in a given year because we compound monthly, typically. Don't have to, but we can compound monthly. So here's that, that's in a given year. Now they talk about what if you do that for multiple years, then it turns into this, which is this thing, the formula that I gave you, okay? The formula that I gave you. Now, what if I say let's compound monthly? Well, n is equal to 12, right? So my equation looks like this. Uh, one plus r over 12, whatever that interest rate is, 12t, okay? But what if I said, let's compound every week? So that's P one plus R over 52, because there are 52 weeks in a year, or approximately so, right? What if I said, eh, let's not compound it weekly, let's compound it daily. P one plus R over 365. We don't usually worry about the quarter, because it's not exactly a quarter anyway. But notice how this number just keeps getting bigger, right? This 365 just get, keeps getting bigger, but it's working in the same way as everything else. What if I said, let's compound not daily, but let's compound it every hour. Well, I have to take 365 times 24, because there's 24 hours in a day. So this big number will be in here and over here. But then what if I said, let's not compound it daily, let's compound it every minute. Well, how many minutes are in an hour? I'm sorry. 365 times 24 times 60. So now this would be the number under there here and here if I was going to compound every minute. What if I was going to compound every second? Well, that's 365 times 24 times 60. That's the number of minutes in a year in T, and it's a year. If I multiply it times 60, that'll be how many seconds that are in a year. So you can see my number getting larger, 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 larger. This number is getting huge. Now this idea of that I'm bringing up is what happens when I compound continuously. So if I increase the number of compounding periods so much so that it's gigantic, now let's say every other, let's say not every second, but every half a second, then I'm going to multiply this times two. Every quarter of a second, I'm going to multiply that number times four. So the idea is if I just increase this number infinitely many times, this is kind of what happens. Let's see if I can get this graph down here pretty quickly. Um, let's turn that off from the previous. Y equals one. Plus one over x. To the x. And we only want to look at this positive side. And then I want to graph this. This is that function. Does it look kind of like this? Uh, P equals a. I'm sorry. Equals a. A equals P one plus R over N to the N N times T. Does this, if I change this to an X, I'm sorry, it's not cooperating with me. This x is that x. This r is 1. So if I just change this to 1, if I don't have a starting amount, can you see that this looks quite the same as this? They look the same, right? So this is a representation of our um, function without some of the other numbers like the principal amount. Now this if I make this x very, very large, this x down here, it gets really, really big, and this gets really, really big too because it's in place of the n. If they gets really, really big, like going towards infinity, 
this graph approaches a particular number. Yes, in fact, it's asymptotic. There's an asymptote. Where's that asymptote? Well, it's at y equals e. This number, 2.718, blah, blah, blah. It's that. That's the asymptote. It gets closer and closer and closer to that, but never gets there. Okay? It never crosses. Notice how the purple thing never crosses over here. Don't worry about it up there. Okay? Because that's because we're talking about numbers greater than zero. We don't put negative, we're not putting any negative x's in here. It's getting closer and closer and closer, but notice how it doesn't really get up against that black dotted line. It's just a little bit below. Okay? But it didn't take too long to get there. So this mathematics, see how it's farther away over here and it gets closer and closer until we're up, up, up on there. Okay? So it's asymptotic to this number. And that number is E, Euclid's constant. Okay? So what ends up happening is this whole thing approaches that value. And there's an algebra problem in chapter 5, 5.7, I guess. Yeah, it's right here, exploring with E, I think. Oh, no, it's a homework problem in the, in the algebra aerobics. So what happens is you can do some math that's super complicated, but we don't need to do that. Um, we don't need to derive it algebraically, but ends up what ends up happening is our formula for compound interest, if I'm compounding continuously, looks like what's in the blue box. So it ends up looking like this. Oops. I'm going to use what I've been using. A equals P E to the RT. The interest rate number jumps up there, because remember, those were the N's, this 1 over N, 1 plus N. This, this was our interest rate, right? This structure here becomes this, and this R ends up flopping up there. It has to do with the has to do with some exponential rules and some other derivation stuff that you don't need to worry about, but we're just going to pass it up. I hope you remember having seen this before in high school. A lot of um, my peers, because we were old and we had this old shampoo called PERT, PERT shampoo, we would always just refer to this equation as PERT. So you need to know when should you use PERT and when not. When? If I'm compounding continuously, I'm making that n get bigger and bigger and bigger, which means I'm, my function is approaching infinity, and then it looks like that curve, which is approaching this e. So this e is that number. It's not a letter, even though it is the letter e. It represents 2.71 blah, 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 blah. Okay? So that's the equation. It's over here on the right as well. So here's an example. This is example three for this video lesson. All right. If you have $250 to invest and you're quoted a nominal interest rate of 4%, that means your R is 4%, construct the equation to, that tells, the equations that tell you how much money you will have if the interest rate is compounded once a year. So through a couple situations, when N equals one, quarterly, when N equals four, once a month, N equals 12, and continuously, or n equals infinity. You're not actually going to substitute infinity, and you know that it's as quickly as I physically possibly could do it, and we just get faster and faster with computers, etc. So we have the different formula. Okay, so um, construct equation. So at four percent, we would have the following: a at four percent. I'm sorry, at quarterly. Let's call it quarterly. A sub q. I'm jumping the gun here. A sub A, which is annually, is the principal amount. One And use different letters, that's fine. Uh, R, 0 0.04, over 1 to the 1 times T. A sub quarterly, that's every four, uh, four different, every three months, four different um, compounding periods. That's going to be 1 plus 0 0.04 over 4 raised to the 4 times T. If I'm going to go monthly, so that's amount after monthly interest, P 1 plus 0 0.04 divided by 12 to the 12 times T. And then continuously is P to the, oops, P to the E to the 0 0.04 T. So P times E to the 0 0.04 T. That was, that's the answers for example tray. And, oh, we're supposed to start with $250 and do the interest for how many years? Oh, 10 years. 
So I think you can do that. You would just substitute 250 in for each of these four P's and then substitute 10 in for T and work that math out, okay? Might I suggest you do that now using your calculator, writing it down on a piece of paper and after hitting pause and checking your answers with what's up on the screen right now. So hit pause, and do that work. Because if you have to do that work later and you've not done it before or it's been two, three years since you've done it, you're gonna have to look it all up again and maybe you'll do something to remember it now, okay? Oh, and by the way, if we're not taking notes when we're watching these videos, that would be a bad choice, I believe. Okay, example four, continuously compounding debt. Suppose you have a debt on which the nominal interest rate is 7% compounded continuously. What is the effective interest rate, the annual percentage yield? So if it's compounded continuously, we have this formula, P, E, R, raised to the RT. If we don't refer, we don't, we're not concerned with P as the amount of interest, we know that the R is 0 0.07 and T is, I don't know. So what do we want to know? We want to know the average annual percentage yield, which means we want to know what R is, meaning not R like 0.07%. We want to know what it is per year, which means we have to convert this thing, E to the 0 0.07, and understand what it is when it's just A, okay, when it's just A. And so why do we want to know when it's just A? Because we want to know what this is, 1 plus R. We want to know what that is because that's my annual percentage yield, my effective interest rate. Remember earlier I called it the annual percentage yield? Here they're finally talking about that in that language. Effective interest rate is the mathy way to talk about it. APY is the, is the accounting way to think about it. So I'm going to put, all I'm simply going to do is put that in my calculator, and it's going to tell me what that value is. So E, how do I get to E? So notice how natural log, it's hard to see probably on my screen because this E to the X is really light colored. So it's the second button, natural log. So second, natural log. We'll understand why that relationship exists between natural log and E to the X. And then I'm going to put 0 0.07 in here and I'm gonna hit enter. And so I get A or e to the 0 0.07 is equal to a, which is equal to 1.0725, which is one plus r, which means that's one plus 0 0.0725, which means my annual percentage yield, my APY, is equal to that little r value, which is different from the one in, in PERT, is 7.25%. Is Okay, and we'll see that we get 7.3, which is 7.25 rounded. And so they did the same, same work. What is the better interest rate? So this is example five. So example five tells us what is the better interest rate? You have a choice between two different bank accounts. One is a passbook account in which you receive 5% per year, compounded once per year. So N is equal to one, R is equal to 0 0.05. Then you have another which pays interest at 4.9%, 0 0.049, 4.9%, and it's compounded continuously. So I'm gonna use, uh, let's say N is equal to infinity compounded continuously. So scenario one, that's this, scenario two is that. So scenario one we have um, A equals P to the one plus R over N to the NT. I suggest every single time you're doing work with this, you write that down so that when it comes to the project, you don't have to look it up. If it was a class we had tests and quizzes, it would be for you not have to memorize that. You would just know it from having written it down 48,000 times, maybe not 48,000 times, but maybe 14 times or 20 times. So P, we're going to use the same P for each one, so it doesn't matter if we use 100 or 1 or, you know, just can't use 0 or a negative number for that matter. 1 plus 0 0.05, N is 1 to the 1 times T, which means I end up getting simple interest of 1.05 to the T. Now, with E, I have to figure out scenario 2, and I get A equals P to E times E to the RT, which is P, I don't care, E to the 0 0.049 raised to the T, okay? 
So again, just like we just did in the example problem just before this, I'm going to put that in my calculator and see if is it going to be less than or greater than 1.05. If it's greater than, then this is the better investment. So e to the so second natural log, you should be doing this right with me or hitting pause to do it yourself, to the point I, 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 0, 0.49. It was definitely going to be better if I typed it in as 0 0.49, 50% interest. So we get the effective or uh, the effective the growth factor, effective growth factor is 1.05022 to the t. So this is exactly this number, version one, and this is a little bit more. I mean, it would not make a difference in the first 20 years, probably. Well, it'll be more but maybe not significantly so. But after 50 years, it will be fairly significant, okay? Uh, you know what, let's go figure that out. If I put $100 in the bank and 1.05 for 50 years, compare that to $100 with 1.05022 for 50 years. Okay, so let's do that one first. This one is my, uh, we're gonna take this number and raise it to 50. I wanted to do that one first because it's already in the calculator. Raise it to 50 and multiply it times 100, right? It's 11.58. So this turns out to be $1,158.83. Now if I just take $100, multiply that times 1.05 raised to the 50, I'm going to make, what, $12 less? But remember, we're talking about $100 that I put in the bank and didn't touch it for 50 years. What if I was adding $100 every month? That would be huge, I think, or much, a lot huger than that, if huger is a word. Where am I, from New York? No offense. So the second one, comp compounding continuously is a better deal and they don't get into it until over here. So 5.02. So the CD is a better better deal compounded continuously. That's what we found as well. Okay, exponential functions base E. So we can generally have exponential functions like this as well. We, we didn't talk about it much, but my whole A can be E to the K. You can see that from the two problems that we just did. And so if K is greater than zero, so now if we have this basic structure I believe there's a blue box coming up as well. So f of t equals c e to the k t. Doesn't this look like pert? So it's just application of the same idea to different scenarios where we don't call it, we don't call p pert like principal or interest. It's just gen making it more of a generic situation. And when k, this coefficient, when k is, is greater than zero, when k is greater than zero, I have exponential growth. Because for these, for this equation, it's always going to be e. So for me to have exponential growth versus exponential decay, I write it this way: e to the seven. That's exponential growth. E to the negative seven. Well, isn't that one over e to the seventh, which is the same as one over e to the seventh, right? That negative sign is what tells me to invert it. So this becomes exponential decay. Why? Because this is a number less than one. So this is what they're talking about here. Instead of having a fraction there to signify that it's exponential decay, we'll end up having a negative exponent. This k value will be negative, and that's what they're telling you here. And then there's the blue box, okay? So another example problem, example six, continuous growth and decay rates. Identify the continuous growth and decay rate. So let me, let's do two of these. So let's say I have a function that was 100 times e to the 0 0.055t. When they want to know what the growth rate is, how do I know this is a growth rate? Well, remember, this k is positive, so it's a growth rate. I can take e to the 0 0.055 and convert it to my a value. When I do that, I just put this in my calculator and get second e to the point zero five five, hit enter, 
this becomes 1.0565. And so what is that? Remember, A is equal to 1 plus R, which means 1.0565, which is equal to 1 plus 0 0.0565. So my growth rate is 5.65 percent okay let's do a second one this one will make sure we look at one that's decay so here let's look at this one because the numbers are different even though they're negative so f of t equals 100 times e to the negative 0 0.02 t okay so my contention is that this negative sign is what's causing it to be exponential decay so let's do the same thing. This e to the negative 0 0.02 is what's in place of my a, right? Because if I have this, it's the same as that. So let's just put this stuff in my calculator, this right here, and figure out that second natural log, so that's e to the negative 0 0.02 is equivalent to 0 0.9801. That's my A value. But remember, my A value is 1 plus R. So I'm going to subtract 1. And I'm going to get a negative R value, correct? Uh, maybe I should take it out to a couple more decimal places. Let's go 0, 02. And so this is going to be, because it makes it look like it's the same as that. And I don't. you shouldn't think of it as the same as this number. So it's going to be negative 0.9, oh, duplicate can't subtract, negative 0 0.0, what is that going to be, 0, 0.0198, okay? And it's negative because it's decay. So my decay rate is equal to 1.98%, okay? 1.98%. So let's see what they have to have to say about their solving of the problem. So they get um, oh, so they get they get uh, five point five for this one, and they get point two. They didn't they rounded a lot, so it looked the same, and I, I don't like that necessarily. <laughs> I want you to see the difference between them, and they use the same number, so they could see to show you that one's decay and one's uh, growth because not because of the point five point zero zero five five or point zero two because of negative and positive.